You may be seated. Well, Happy New Year. Welcome to 2024. What was the first thing you did to welcome in the new year? For me, I spent some time with Brandon, and, uh, you know, as good old Chinese boys do, we watched other people burn their cash away. <laughs> Take a look at the view from his house. We've got a little video clip that we took, right? It's not even midnight yet, and this thing was going off. Look at that. That's from Kapalama Heights. That's at his house. Yeah, we didn't have to burn anything. His neighbors were burning all their money away. And you look at Kalihi Valley. This is all Kalihi Valley. Yeah, right there. Look at that. Right down the street. And then it, it was so smoky, you couldn't see a thing. By midnight, it was so covered with smoke. You couldn't even see the house lights. You couldn't see anything. And, uh, and they say that, uh, yeah, fireworks are illegal in Hawaii. But... <laughs> yeah, we carried on the old New Year's Eve tradition. We watched other people burn their money away. I think one thing we can agree with uh, when it comes to the new year, that we all want to start the year with good intentions. Amen? We all want to start with good intentions. It's like, you know, speaking of, of, of Chinese brothers, like these three uh, Chinese brothers who uh, they uh, went to buy uh, a New Year's gift for their mom. And their mom was getting old, the mom was losing her eyesight. And so the first brother, you know, Chinese, Pakes, they're all doctors, lawyers, engineers. So the first brother buys the mom a house on Hawaii Law Ridge. Beautiful house, like 15 rooms, three levels, whatever. And so the mom writes him a note and she goes, You no understand. I'm too old. No can clean house so big. No, it's not good. So the second brother buys her a top-of-the-line Tesla, I mean, filled with all the bells and whistles. The mom writes him a thank you note. No can see, no can drive. <laughs> so the third brother, knowing that the mom loves the Bible, loves the scripture, he buys her a parrot that can recite every book in the Bible. And so she writes him a thank you note. You have always been the most thoughtful son. You know exactly what I need. The parrot, the chicken was delicious. <laughs> they had good intentions. <laughs> they all had good intentions. And we always start everything new with good intentions. That's just our heart. That's where we want to be. That's where we want to go. And so we want to begin 2024 with this little mini-series. going to carry us for the next uh, couple of weeks. This mini-series that we're calling Beyond Good Intentions, Living for a greater purpose. Living for a greater purpose. But you got to get beyond just good intentions. I was talking to Pastor Brandon uh, as we we're getting ready for the new year, and uh, we recognize that this church is where we are today because of the grace of God. Last week we talked all about the grace of God. That's what this church's foundation is based on. Uh, this month, actually, we're going to be celebrating our 12th anniversary. We have been in existence for 12 years. It's like 11 years more than I thought we would. Uh, but, and it was only because of the grace of God. If you were with us at Aloha Tower, if you were with us from the very beginning, I mean, I really believe that the devil tried to take us down from the get-go. From the very beginning of this, the starting of this church, everything that we went through that first, second year alone was like we would not be here if not for the grace of God. From my leukemia to some other things that happened, and then HPU coming into Aloha Tower and then moving us out, and we had to find a place. It's a real, sh real short, short story that we had to get out in 30 days, no place to find. I went driving all over the place looking for a place. I didn't want to go to a school to so have to set up and take down and all that stuff. And so we ended up here. This, this guy just told me, you should check this place out. So I drive by. How many of you drove by here and thought, that's a warehouse. What kind of church is going to be in a warehouse, right? Yeah. You, you don't even know. When I walked in here. This place was already built. The church that was here, a Pentecostal church, was getting ready to move. They bought a place out in Kapolei. I said, oh, when are you moving? The day they were moving was the same day we had to get out of Lower Tower. And the guy built this place. This place was all built. All we needed to get was chairs. We had folding chairs. And we had big construction halogen lights that I couldn't see anything. 
But this place was built. This was a Pake's dream come true. I didn't, <laughs> didn't spend a dime on this place. And, and God has carried us through these last 11 years, 12 years, by his grace. And so Brandon and I were talking about that, and I said, you know, Brandon, but I, I'm sensing, the word I'm sensing for this next year is not just the grace of God, it's intentionality. That we need to put our hands to the plow and be very intentional about where we're going from this time forward, moving forward. And he said, Dad, you know, I was praying about that, and I felt the same thing. He says, more than having good intentions, it's living with intentionality. And I want to talk to us about you know, today as we start this brand new series that, uh, you know, how do we move forward to live a life of intentionality? We've been through COVID. That was by the grace of God. You should see us behind the scenes. I'll just pull the curtains back. We had no idea what we were doing, honestly. <laughs> COVID hit, everything shut down. What do we do? How do we get online? How do we do these things? By the grace of God. But it's time we move forward intentionality because God says in his word, Ask, seek, knock. If you ask, if you seek, if you knock, then the door will open. There's a requirement on our part to take an active part in doing what he wants us to do. Now, not just sit back and say, by your grace, God, you got to ask, you got to seek, you got to knock, then the door will open. When we seek him with all of our hearts, says Jeremiah, God assures us, I know the plans I have for you. I know the plans I have for this church. I know the plans that I have for every single one of us. But you have to come to me, and you have to pray. You have to take action steps of intentionality. That scripture again, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. We all memorize this from, you know, some other church that we go to. Plans to prosper and not to harm. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me. Come and pray. See, these are steps that we, we, we need to take intentionally. Come and pray, and then I'll listen to you. You will seek me and find me when? When you seek me with all your heart. There's a commitment that he's asking for. He's asking us just not just to say, okay, yeah, we have good intentions. He's consistently calling us into a life of intentionality to pursue him with all of our hearts. Because you see, living as a believer is more than just keeping rules, being sincere. It's more than just admitting that, oh, Jesus, yeah, he has good advice. It's more than that. It's living intentionally with a passionate commitment that God has a greater purpose. God has a greater purpose for our lives. Amen? Amen. Okay, let me say it again. Let me, let me hear people that are passionate. <laughs> let me hear people that are committed. Don't lie, right? We're in church. God has a greater purpose. Amen? Amen. Yeah, I'm glad you believe in that because he constantly tells us that. Uh, Mark chapter 10. A short parable about, um, about what commitment is all about. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, okay? So you know what to do. You've listened to sermons before. You've heard music on the radio. You've heard other people talk to you. You know what to do. You know the commandments. One, you should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. He loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go and sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Go and sell everything you have. I know all our pockets reading this now going, oh, man, I cannot do that. <laughs> Go and sell 
Active step, action step. Give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This parable is not about wealth. It's not about necessarily giving. It's not necessarily about how much money you have and how much money you give away. You know the point of this whole parable? It's about commitment. It's about commitment. It's about living intentionally committed to the things God is asking us to do. Would you write this down somewhere? 95 commitment, 95 percent commitment is still 5 percent short. 95 percent commitment is still 5 percent short. Now, we're not talking about, and let me just be clear about this, we're not talking about the motivation behind what this man wanted to do or the intentions of what he wanted to do. We're talking about the intentions, what he wanted to do, but he didn't do it. Living intentionally is not only having good intentions, it's actually taking the step to do it, to follow through with what you're saying. Mark, uh, Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who said out, out with me, who what? Does his will of my Father who is in heaven. James 1, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. Because we all have good intentions, and good intentions are good, but they're not good enough. They're not good enough. And that's true for every aspect of our lives. We all get to the new year, we want to lose weight. We all want to lose weight, but we don't do anything to change the status quo. It's like this, this lady, uh, this, this woman who was married to this guy, and she saw him standing on the scale, and he's sucking in his stomach, and she goes, you know that's not going to help. He says, oh, yeah, it does. It helped me to see the numbers on my scale. <laughs> he thinks just by sucking things in, that's going to change. We do nothing to change the status quo. We want to get out of debt, but we do nothing about living according to a budget. Or we do nothing about the impulsive buying that we, we see. Amazon, oh, Amazon, oh, you want this? Amazon. I am so guilty of that. Joy goes over our charge account all the time, and she goes, hey, what's this Amazon thing, and Amazon thing, and Amazon thing? You know, we have this impulsive buying that we can't stop, so we can't get out of debt. We intend to strengthen our marriage. But how much more time do we spend on social media than anything else. I've seen couples, not anybody here, so don't feel uncomfortable. I've seen couples in the restaurant sitting across the table from each other, you know, talking to, I don't know who, this one old couple, they were, they were texting each other like, oh, you're going to order that? Well, I'm going to order it. They're talking about what they're going to order from the menu. They're texting each other. You know, we, we want to do something, but we do nothing positive to get it done, and it's no different with our spirituality. We intend to live a more spiritual life, but what are we doing about the disciplines that God is asking us to do? Forgive, get into the Word of God, uh, tithing, sacrificing, trusting God, obedience to the things of God. You know, instead we allow distractions to get in the way. We're, we're too busy, or we're too tired, or I'll just do it tomorrow. Why put off to tomorrow what you can do today? See, the things that, 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 that confuse us are the, the intentions that we want to do something good, but we never get anything done. Good intentions are good, but they're not good enough. God has more in 2024. How many of you would agree with me by a resounding amen that God has more in 2024? Amen. God does have so much more for us to experience, for us to, to, to realize, but it only comes about with living intentionally, living with intentionality. So here's the big idea. If you haven't caught it by now, here's the big idea for today and for this whole year. Good intentions plus intentionality allows you to realize God's greater good. 
whatever you're looking for in your life, in your marriage, in your relationship with your kids, in your schoolwork, in your job performance, good intentions with the things that you need to do intentionally will help you to realize the good that God has for you. So how do we bridge this good intentions with intentionality? What's stopping us sometimes? How do we walk across that bridge? One word, attitude. Your attitude. Having the right attitude. Your attitude will either catapult you towards or cancel you from experiencing God's best. See, a good attitude, a right attitude will catapult you toward God's best or bad attitude, apathetic attitude, attitude of well, whatever is, is going to cancel you from realizing God's best. Your attitude and not your aptitude will determine your altitude. This is a John Maxwell principle. Your attitude and not your aptitude not the things you can do, cannot do. Your attitude, not your aptitude, will, con will determine your altitude. Whether you're going to reach that goal or whether you're going to fly just a mediocre status quo kind of a life. There's a guy named Roger Crawford. Roger Crawford is a man who um, is quite impressive. Um, would it impress you about him if I told you he is a sought-after consultant, he's an author of many books, he's a well-known public speaker, he's recognized in the Fortune 500 companies, he was a collegiate tennis player, he was certified by the U.S. Tennis Association. Does that kind of impress you? Okay, well, what, what if I told you that he was born with a condition called ectrodactyly, ectrodactyly, Actodactyly is actually a condition where, congenital condition, where you're born either without a hand or a foot, or you're born with, uh, without fingers. Roger was born without a hand, with one foot. He had a thumb-like projection sticking out from his left hand. He had no palms. He has a shrunken foot. His left foot was actually amputated at five years old. Here's a picture of Roger actually holding a tennis racket. I remember he was certified by the U.S. Tennis Association. Given that condition, how did he get there? Roger believed in his heart that he's, he was not going to be defeated because his parents told him, you can become all that you want to be. You'll only be handicapped as much as you want to be. And Roger refused to be handicapped. And so he pursued life like he was just anyone else. And he became such an accomplished, motivational speaker and a leader and a businessman and an author and a tennis player of all things, professionally recognized. Roger didn't realize the power of his parents' counsel, that you'll only be as handicapped as you want to be, until he met another man who had the same condition as him. The man was a little bit older, so Roger thought, well, it'd be good to get to know this guy. Maybe he could be like a mentor because he, he knows what life is like. He's been through the same issues that I've been through. And Roger met this guy, and within a few minutes of his conversation, recognized that he couldn't have been further from the truth. This man was not the same as Roger. He found this man to be more bitter and pessimistic and this man blamed all of his life's problems upon his condition. This man lived his life actually believing that the world owes me. And Roger said, unfortunately, the world disagreed. And Roger recognized that it wasn't the physical condition that was holding him back. It was his attitude. His attitude kept him and canceled him from the very best. You see, the difference was Roger's attitude wasn't defined by his circumstances. Roger redefined his, his circumstances by his, his, uh, his attitude. And so Roger wrote in a book once, he said, the only difference between you and me is that you can see my handicap, but I can't see yours. We all have them. 
And when people ask me how I've been able to overcome my physical handicaps, I tell them that I haven't overcome anything. I simply learned what I can't do, such as play the piano or eat with chopsticks. But more importantly, I've learned what I can do. And then I do what I can with all my heart and my soul. What attitude do you want to carry into this next year? As you're looking at the whole new year ahead of you, a whole new season of life wherever you find yourself, what attitude are you carrying into this new year? Because God's best awaits for you to discover. And this is the first part of a three-part mini-series, like I said. So we've got to start somewhere, right? So here's where we're going to start. We're going to start. We're going to use an acronym, S-T-A-R-T, to start off the new year. Here's what S stands for. The S is stop making excuses. Seize your moment. Seize that opportunity that you have. You have this time with your family. You have this time at your workplace. You have this time while you're still in school. You have this time. God has given you a moment. Stop making excuses. And whatever you feel the Lord is asking you to do, start. Start. Write this somewhere. Initiate. Don't hesitate. Initiate. Don't hesitate. Too many times we kind of weigh options. Nothing wrong with that. We get counsel from people. Nothing wrong with that. But at some point, the Lord is wanting to move you forward. Take a step. Take a step. What is it for you? There's a, uh, a story in, in Genesis 19. Go read it. Today was on my morning devotional. And it's about Abraham and Lot. Um, and Lot is in the, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember the story? Sodom and Gomorrah, just, just filthy, just terrible conditions. But the Lord really had a heart for Lot, Abraham's nephew, and wanted to move him out of that city before he came down and destroyed the city. And so he's telling Lot, go to the mountains. Get out of here. Go to the mountains. And uh, um, you know, so I can, I can you know, take care of business here and, and destroy everything here. And Lot says, well, I can go there, but what about this small town over there? And, and the angel, he looks at him and goes, Lot, whatever you're going to do, just do it. And here's a phrase, because I can't do anything until you get there. Can't do anything about what? I can't do anything about your past. I can't destroy everything about your past until you make the move to get to where you need to go. And I thought, start. Start doing something. Hurry up. See, you, you, you can't sit in the land of indecisiveness. And many times that's where we find ourselves. Well, I could do this and I could do that, all right. I could do this, I could do that, okay, that's good. But at some point, you got to do something. See, that's living intentionally. This church would not be where we are. This church would not be where we are. If you just kind of rewind the tape, and I didn't make a move, and it's not about me, okay? Please forgive me if, if I come across this way. It's not about me. But we would not be here right now. All of this that we're going through right now would be like this. It would be just a, a, just a puff of someone's imagination. If I didn't say, well, I'm sitting on the bench as a judge, okay, this is it. I got to go. I remember the last hearing that I had, and that day, everything was the last. So you sit in your chambers, and when the case is ready, the clerk buzzes you, it buzzes in your chambers, it's time to put on your, your robe, zip up, you go in front of the mirror, fix your hair, and then you walk out, you know, so that's a, the, the process. So my last, 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 last thing on my calendar. I was so tempted to go to work with shorts and T-shirt and just put on my robe, but I, I couldn't. So I'm sitting there at, at my desk, and I'm thinking this. I'm going, it's my last case. The buzzer goes off. It's the last time I'm going to hear the buzzer. Put on my robe. I zip up. It's the last time I'm zipping up my robe. And I walk out, come to the court. All rise. 
judge of the uh, court of the First Circuit, that whole introduction thing. I'm thinking, it's the last time I'm going to hear that. It's the last time people are going to stand up for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, calls the case, we go to the whole hearing, make my decision. I'm thinking, it's the last decision I'm ever going to make. You know, all these last, 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 last. And then when the case was done, this lawyer said something so interesting. He said, Your Honor, I just, I just have to tell you that I res respect you because of what you're doing. I said, wow. Here I'm thinking the world would think, oh, you're nuts, man. You're leaving that to do what? I just want to tell you how much I respect what you're doing. You know, da, da, da. So I go out. Last time I'm leaving, last time sitting on this seat, <laughs> walk out, take off my robe, I'm done. But it began a whole new chapter. It led to being a pastor. It led to going to China, adopting this boy. Oh, crazy. I came back home. It led to being a part of this church. There was just a huge church. It led to planting this church. It led to... I mean, if I didn't go to the doctor when he told me to go to the doctor, if I had just waited and hesitated, I'd be dead. I mean, the things that you do, you don't know what that is out there. When it's time to do something, you got to do it. You got to take that step forward. I mean, you talk about me and Brandon, you know, some of you know the backstory. I came from a broken marriage, and yet God allowed us to reconnect because I called him one night when he was 16 years old. And that, that phrase, initiate, don't hesitate, started a whole new relationship between my son and I. And today he's the, the succeeding pastor. Where is the guy, by the way? I'm always doing these things, you know. I, <laughs> he's in Green Bay. He surprised Kara with a Christmas present. They're freezing in the snow in Lambeau Field right now. But we connected, and it started a whole new thing because you cannot hesitate. When God asks you to move, move, take a step. Take a step. Not that you have to conquer the world. You take a step. T. Take an inventory of the lessons that you've learned. We talked about assessment last week. It doesn't stop. Take an inventory. What lessons have you learned in this last year that's going to make you a better person this year? Not what lessons have you learned from last year that's beaten you up and now this year is not worth living for. No, no, no. You take an assessment so you can know the mistakes that were made and you know how to move forward. You know how to replan and reprogram and, and, and reprioritize the things in order to move forward so you can start doing what the Lord has been asking you to do. Um, you like it or not, I guess I'm a Dolphins fan. Um, I had a, I, I never really followed a team before. We used to follow like 49ers, you know, because of Russ Francis and local players and all that. But this time, Tua Tango Vailoa my cousin, uh, but he's, <laughs> so I follow them, and oh, last week, they got bust up. The ravens flew all over them, put it like that, and pooped all over them, and, and they got their, can I say butt in church? They got their butts whooped, man. I mean, it was, was a bad game, and it bothered me, and I, and I watched that game, and uh, and then and HBO has this thing called Hard Knocks. They've been following the team, you know. I don't have HBO. But sometimes if you go on YouTube, somebody will pirate that, and they'll put the entire episode. So I was watching YouTube, and I caught this, this, this episode where they talked about beating the Dallas Cowboys, beating the Dallas Cowboys, and then they, then they went into the Ravens game and how they got just bust up. But there was a segment in that during the game where the coach, McDaniel, is walking the sidelines. It's kind of cool because they might come up and everything. He's walking the sidelines. He's by himself. He's going, and they're getting bust up. And he's saying, I'll never give up. I'll never give up. I'll never give up. He's talking to himself. And then they show a shot with him and Tua, quarterback, and I think the quarterback coach. And he's telling Tua, he says, he says, you know, we have to fight 
against the urge that we all have as humans, that when things are going so bad, that we just go, well, whatever's. That we just, just, just let it happen and not even care. He said, we have to fight again. That's the natural urge that we have. And he's telling him this during the game. We have to fight against that. What we have to do is take a look at what lessons that we learned from this, and then we apply it to the next game, and we move on to the next game. I thought, wow, that was so cool. That made me feel so much better. <laughs> I don't know, after tonight's game, I don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, they're, they're for you that know. But I thought, that's, that's, that's exactly what this thing is all about. You, you stop making excuses. You take an assessment what you went through, what worked, what didn't work. You take those lessons, next game. This is a new year, new opportunity. As we talked about last week, clean slate, mulligan, second chance, whatever you want to call it. This is a new opportunity. It's a new game. Take the lessons and apply it. Number, and, and letter A, act in faith. You won't see it all there. You won't know what that is in the end. God may be prompting you to do something. You don't know what the result is. What are you expecting in 2024? Act in faith. You know what faith is? Go read it. Faith, Hebrew 11. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. I have hopes for my marriage. I have hopes for my job. I have hope. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we don't see. When God said to Abraham, move from where you are, and here's the words from the Bible, from where you are, to the land I will show you. Well, where, God? The land I will show you. He didn't know where he was going. All he knew is that God was saying to move, packed up his bags, took that first step, and as they say, the rest is history. There's no guarantee. See, the journey is more critical than the destination. What you learn along the way, the relationship that you develop with the Lord and with others along the way is more critical than the eventual destination. If God wanted you to have a million dollars, he could give you a million dollars. Anybody believe in that? I believe in that. If God wanted you to have a better job, he could give you a better job. You know what he cannot give you? What you learn along the way in the journey. The journey is more critical than the destination, and there are no shortcuts to discovering God's best. There's no way of getting around it but to go through the journey. Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, let it be done to you. According to your faith, let it be done to you. And then the R, renew your thoughts. Renew your thoughts. Stop making excuses. Begin to take an inventory of the lessons. Act in faith, but you have to act in faith with the right thoughts. Psalm 23 says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Romans 12 says, by the transformation of your mind, don't be conformed to the ways of the world, but transformed by the ways of your mind, by your thinking. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart with all diligence. Your heart and your head, same thing. The central being of who you are. Guard it with all you have because out of that will flow the issues, your decisions, the things that you do in life. Nothing can defeat you without your permission. The things that you face in this new year that will come against you, or you're going to get opposition. You will. But it cannot defeat you without you giving that, whatever challenge is, permission to defeat you. Where does that start? In your mind. Your attitude. And then T, trust in the Lord. How much trust? All your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Well, what about? No, no, trust in the Lord. You pray. You get counsel. Weigh the options. When it's time to start, start. Take a step. But what if this? You, know, you trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In everything that you're going to do as you're moving forward, you acknowledge that he's God. I'm not. 
He knows the plans that I have for my life. I don't. I'm taking an action step forward. Acknowledge that he's God. And the Proverbs ends with what? And he will make your path straight. He will set you on your right way. There's a, a, a book called Ruthless Trust. Brennan Manning talks about a, a New York businessman, John Cavanaugh. This guy's in a stock market, he's successful, but he's just confused about life. And so he just wants clarity. Why can't God make it so clear on what the steps I need to take to go forward? So he flies all the way to Calcutta, India to meet with Mother Teresa. Because if anybody has clarity in what to do, it'd be Mother Teresa. So he ends up in this orphanage, and Mother Teresa finds out that he's looking for her. And so she goes, oh, so my son, what can I do for you? He said, Mother Teresa, my life is so confusing. I just need clarity. And if anybody can show me that, it's you. And she goes, my son, it's not clarity that you should seek. It's trust. And I pray that you trust in God. I read that, I went, oh. God can do everything in this world. Nothing's impossible with God, amen? Nothing's impossible. Nothing is impossible except he cannot make you trust him. How much you trust him, whether you trust him, whether you believe in him, that's your choice. And the journey along the way will help you to develop that trust. How much do you trust him? How much do you trust him? Trust him, pure trust. No questions, no doubts. Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Because everything we do leads to where God wants us to be. That's wisdom. To live a life under the covering of God's plan and God's best for our lives, that's wisdom. To walk away from that is foolishness. How do we know where to go? One of our prayers should be, Lord, teach us to number our days. In other words, don't let me waste my time. Because every day should be precious. Should be a time where we don't waste another day in this new year. It should be that every day we live in this new year is lived with intentionality. To intentionally do the things that God is asking us to do. I was... Uh, just looking at some things, and I came across this, this example of a guy who was a um, young man who was talking to this older man. And he said, you know, if you were able to go back in time and talk to your 20-year-old self, what would you tell him? So the man pulled out these, these uh, strips of paper. And I'll just use script here. He said, let's say that this is 100 years. 100 years. And um, what they say is our life expectancy as men, get ready for this, guys, life expectancy is like 75 years. Um, because of COVID, the years have gotten shorter. For women, I think it's 79 years. So if this is 100 years, and our life expectancy is 75 that means everything from 75 on, I'm not going to see this. I mean, if I get to live longer than that, and I, I don't say this to alarm anybody who's living longer than that, <laughs> um, but if you live longer than that, let's find actuarial tables who make adjustments for us. But if you live longer than 75, you count it a blessing, but because of physical conditions and whatever, the quality of life still won't be the same, okay? So anything beyond 75 in general, I'm not going to see that. I'm 69. I'll admit that I'm 69. That means everything up to 69 is gone. I'll never see those years again. Which leaves me with this. That's all I got. And what I got is all I got. 
I'm watching this thing, I'm thinking, whoa, that's hitting me. It's true, isn't it? Now, some of you are younger. You're saying, oh, no, but I got a lot longer than that. That's, that's true. You might have a lot more than this. You get hit with one illness. You don't know what that quality of life will be. You get in an accident. You don't know what that quality of life will be. But just looking at this alone, for me, said a lot. And so, that older man said to the younger man, so when you look at what you got, Here's what I would say. Live your life. Start doing what you need to do. Why are you waiting? He says this. He said, live each day as a life in miniature. In other words, live each day. If each one of these tickets is another year, my whole life should be lived in this one day. Because I don't know whether I'm going to have anything else after that. But this is all I got. Live your life. Live it on steroids. I mean, don't go crazy, okay? Don't go out drinking and partying. Oh, right, you know, it's time to party. No, no, no. What is God asking you to do in this next year? What is God asking? Just, just focus on this next year. What is God asking you in your heart to do in this next year? Start. Take an inventory. I don't know what that is. Act in faith. Renew your thinking in your mind. Trust that God has the best for you. I know the plans I have for you, but you got to come to me, and you got to pray, and I will listen to you, and then you'll realize how much God has in store for you. He says, wake up each morning with gratitude that you thank God that he said, I trust you with another day. I'll pray that often. Lord, thank you for waking me up this morning, giving me the breath of life, for your trusting me with one more day. That you trust that I will live this life, that you have almost given me a vote of confidence, God, that this day is for you. And you wake up every day with that heart of gratitude. And then he says, you live it like you dream it. You know what that is? Live it. I was watching this guy. Uh, sorry, I got to get to a golf analogy. You know what I mean. This guy was saying, you know when you step up to the ball, he's a professional golfer, and he hits the ball. He said, when you step up to the ball, you got to understand that between you and your caddy, you've already taken into account the water hazard, the sand, the trees, the bushes. And so when you have that club in your hand, you have already made a decision that that's the best club that's going to get you where you want to go. So when you get up to the ball, just hit the ball. You know, don't stand over the ball and go, oh, I don't know if I'm twisted this way, twisted this way. You know, you already have made all that decision in your mind. So when you get up to the ball, get a, get a, get a mental picture of where you want that ball to go, get up and just swing the ball, swing the, swing the club. Live it. Live it. Now, why is this message, I believe, so important for us today? It's not only because of the new year. It's not only for you individually. This is a message, I really believe, prophetically, is for the church. There was a, uh, a time in 2013, so my leukemia, 2012, got the diagnosis, the treatment, and all that. 2013, uh, a friend of mine, a good pastor friend of mine, no, he brings in a prophet every once in a while. Yeah, I don't know much about prophets. And he says, hey, I want you to come and um, let this guy give a prophecy over you. So again, not fully like, okay, you know, this is good. I went there. I met, never met the guy before, and my friend said he doesn't tell this guy anything about whoever he brings. And we sat there, me and Joy, Jared, Brandon. And this guy began to speak some words about what I had gone through. I don't know how he knew this stuff. 
But then he began to talk about the church. Now, it's the very beginning now, right? He's just starting the church. And these are the words, an excerpt of the prophecy that was given back in 2013 for this church. He says, Elwin, you have a good heart. And son, I, know, I want you to know that it wasn't a mistake that you're there. I put you there supernaturally. I know you kind of feel like, man, what wind blew me in there? Even the time you came, but I put you there by my spirit, son. And let me just tell you now, it wasn't a mistake. I put you there. I know, I know that the landing may have been a little bit rougher than you thought, but I put you there. And I know the foundation that you hit wasn't right. That thing's been reduced to rubble. But the concrete of my spirit's come in. And I'm going to solidify what you've been saying. Trust me now, son. You've been laying a new foundation in that church. It's not been my mistake. And I'm going to raise up a great platform in that place. And when I allow a foundation to seemingly be eradicated, it's because I'm going to build a better one. And I am. And when the enemy taunts you and says, how can these burnt stones be used? Like in the book of Jeremiah, I love rubble, son. I specialize in rubble because rubble becomes concrete in my hands. The spirit of the master builder is on you. And you are a patient man. You don't quit easy. You don't run easy. I'm going to give you the right word that will solidify that thing. Yes, the process have been, has been hard. But as you continue to solidify the foundation you have, you're going to find that thing coalesce. And you're going to find it solidify. And then you're going to find me adding people, says the Lord. The biggest battle you'll face in that church is the battle to set the foundation. And you're halfway through that process of setting it. And I'm going to set that thing for you. And if you're faithful, and you will be, I'm going to add and add and add and I'm going to build something that won't break under pressure it's not about numbers it's about building a part of the kingdom of God that's going to reach more and more and more but we can't do it by just sitting back and saying hey God you've been a God of grace so thank you for that and expect this prof prophetic word to come true. We all got to step up. Your individual lives, the things that we do as leadership, because we know that God has something much greater ahead, that God has more in 2024. And it's only by having good intentions plus living with intentionality that we're going to realize the best that God has for us. That's why this whole thing is so important for us, that we start and we move ahead. If you agree with that, would you just say amen to that? Amen. 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 Yeah. Let's stand. Let me pray and we'll finish. <laughs> Father, thank you, Lord, for just so much that you've done for our lives, um, for this church. The lessons that we've learned, not just in this past year, but even in the past. Thank you, Father, for the gathering of your saints, people who have a heart to follow you, people who have a heart to live with intentionality according to the things that you've asked us to do. So as we look ahead and we plan our lives out for this next year, Father, may there be never a day wasted that every moment we know that we're trusting you for the next step forward. And Father, we realize that as we take one step at a time, as we move into the newness that you have for us, that one day we'll look back and we'll realize, man, you really provided the best for us. So we praise you, Lord, on this first Sunday of the new year. We praise you. We give you all the glory. Father, we want to be a blessing to you in 2024. We love you in Jesus' name.
And the church says, Amen. 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 Would you thank him this morning with a clap? Thank you, Lord.